in an enemy stare. Quite a few top-level people of the international psychedelics research scene were there. Guided by Dutch poet and psychedelic writer Simon Vinkenoog, they spoke about aspects of drugs, therapy, law, and other things concerning psychedelics and other uh, substances like MDMA. One of the main speakers was Dr. Alexander Shugin, known as the father of ecstasy. He is the person who has uh, made, invented, discovered uh, tens of uh, substances of, of psychedelic drugs and other substances, and notably uh, 2CB and STP. He has written a book called PICAL, and he was in Amsterdam for a workshop. Another speaker was Charles Kaplan. He is a drug researcher at the University of Maastricht. And then there was Richard Jensen. He is one of the very few people in the United States allowed to do uh, psychology research with psychedelic drugs like LSD. The four of them in a debate and in a very amicable atmosphere and we hope you enjoy their conversation as much as we did. This is Mister Media, thank you. The use of plants, the native use of plants, the southern uh, hemisphere shamanistic use of the northern hemisphere uh, 20th century counterpart of shamanism. It was a very excellent workshop and it also brought together people in a very informal way who uh, were keenly interested in this area and I was amazed and amused to watch them come together in the first day shaking hands, oh yes, uh, I'm glad to meet you. In the second day they found they had eight friends in common and by the third day they were hugging and even more. And uh, also there, there was properly no, uh, no use of any uh, pharmacological agents. Officially. Officially, yes. Uh, it turns out there is a great deal of uh, cattle in the area. It is a jungle area. It rains every two days and the sun comes out for three days. And there's a minor plant known as cubensis. Uh, uh, depending on the psilocybe cubensis, you may not be familiar with a small mushroom. That has a uh, yes, yes. And uh, the, uh, the place that cook in the, in the area also made hot water available so you could make tea of it. You found the entire dynamics of the society be totally magical in that the, the what they call there rather casually the caca de vaca. It's a little patty gun. <laughs> Mushrooms grow. Uh, you, you pick the mushroom. Yeah, not yet. So I'm going to have a lesson to me. Yes, and the, uh, there would be small <coughs> Indian boys or Mexican boys who go out in the fields and would bring in bags of it. They would sell the bags to the, to the gringos. Uh, the local police would sort of confiscate the bags or leave it there in exchange for a hundred pesos. So there was a, and then if they took the thing, you'd find them the next day selling it in the, in the ruins to the same people from whom they confiscated the 100 peso bribe. It was an extraordinary second world of, of society geared totally around the fact that these spores, these mushrooms grow there natively and the, their use is, is well understood. Anyway, by the end of the first week, there was a, a, a true uh, recognition of a, of, a, of a culture, of a, of a society that very rarely gets a chance to, to see one another and to meet one another on this types of grounds. In a sense, I, I feel the same sort of society may be here. Is that a new alchemy maybe coming up? Uh, it's here. I mean, we're looking for uh, hidden treasures and uh, mm -hmm. there's a uh, stone of philosophy, uh, secret of wisdom. What is secret of wisdom to you? Can you make it uh, public? Is I that for your workshops? Or if, if wisdom is at hand, if you know the material and you don't make it public, you are not, you are not really a complete person. Yes. But isn't wisdom something you, you exchange, like uh, information, or it could be satsang, where people are in your presence and they feel good of it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to take the entire stand with you. I mean, if I'm here for the funny uh, question, he doesn't decide to do it. Then I must be one. Well, let's hope this is. Let's hope we get the answer.
scientist. <laughs> Well, well as, a, as a sociologist, I'm very intrigued by your comment that, uh, well, the first, uh, the first uh, day of the, of the workshop, there was, uh, it was a workshop, and then the, the mushrooms came, and then the, the second day, people were hugging, and the third day, the they, were hugged, they were making love, and then it went, and where did it go? from there. In other words, it's called you are the sociologist. Remember we had this email, this very this email uh, uh, communication about two years ago and uh, and I uh, I sort of said, well when people are taking uh, mushrooms or LSD and they have the experience of uh, of seeing God that uh, that what this experience is, is the relation of uh, God in us, which turns out to be, as in our Christian tradition, we are created in the image of God as men and women. So we're seeing men, men and women together, which is, we're seeing society and kinds of society. And what you described to me was a society that was emerging there and that's emerging. You said, well, here, here too. And this, uh, I mean, this society, uh, uh, which is, uh, we had this talk over dinner, Richard, a little bit uh, uh, today, uh, when you talked about the protocol that would be necessary to to use LSD in order to improve, let's say, society or to improve. So, social relations or to group individual functioning. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could just tell a little bit about that. That is very much a no. Because I think he, he saw it in, in Mexico, in Palenque, and yet you're, you're just saying, no, we can't have a, a this isn't a medication that we give as a pill in a double blind, which, which Sasha gave us, a, a scientist, a methodology in 1980. 81 or 82, which, which when I tried to write this up as the textbook for the Open University toxicology thing, they paid me the first 3,000 guilders for it. They, they read it, they said, oh, this is very good. And then the students, when they said, well, hey, this isn't toxicology because you have to have randomized control trials. This is what we learn in the books. So what's this double conscious stuff in order to understand the toxicology of, of drugs? So I'm just trying to yeah, well, I, I was talking to you at dinner about a, uh, the notion that, in a sense, we've been using the wrong paradigm to look at psychedelics since their rediscovery in the West by Albert Hoffman in 1943. Uh, that because Albert Hoffman was working in a modern drug laboratory, he must have discovered a drug that would fit within our notion of what a drug is and does without <coughs> modifying our notion of what a drug is and does. And I think that most assuredly in the, what is it, 53 years now, that have followed, what we have proved is that there is something quite unique about these kinds of things. That um, they, you may see God, you may see the devil, you may do wonderful acts, you may do terrible acts. These acts, these experiences live in human beings, they don't live in these compounds. Double-blind placebo methodology is a scientific method for developing compounds where the effectiveness resides in the compound. And these are compounds where the effectiveness does not reside in the compound. There is some way in which these compounds amplify the human sensibility to the setting and intention with which they're used. So they're an entirely new branch of medicine. Um, they're not really part of the medicine that has this direct pharmacological action. You, know, you take an analgesic, it stops pain. Isn't that, um, the, isn't that the shortcoming of the English language? <coughs> where by drug you mean as well uh, a narcotic as well as a medicinal drug? We have the uh, uh, word medicine, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, when you go to the apotheke and you get a medicine, which uh, uh, you you mean uh, the discovery of it is a medicine. Well, I mean, there's a there's a conception around these compounds 
Uh, for instance, let's talk about pain, analgesia. Uh, if someone is dying of cancer and they have, let's say, bone metastasis, is a terribly, terribly difficult and painful metastasis to have. Enormous pain. We can, uh, if we want to be as humane as we can within the existing medical paradigm, perhaps we give this person, uh, and you're going to have to excuse me because I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm, when I'm talking about this, it may be that there would be another, another analgesic of choice, but I think that morphine would, would be quite a good one. Intravenously administer uh, under the control of the individual who's dying. <laughs> So they can have as much or as little as they would all prefer everything to be given to be. But I, I think that what's interesting is that in the work that we did with cancer patients with LSD, first of all, one would never administer the LSD as an intravenous drip. Second of all, it is all in the manner in which the LSD is introduced to the person, the relationship that you have with the person, the way that you are reviewing their life with them and the meaning of their life with them, and orienting them toward looking at that. God's then, towards the use. Then the compound is administered within a loving, caring, human relationship <coughs> trying to help an individual to value the most valuable thing that they've been given fully before they die. And then the compound is introduced to amplify that set and setting. Um, and afterwards, a third of our subjects reported absolutely phenomenal and dramatic relief from pain, where they required no medication at all. How many subjects were there? There were about 60 subjects in the study, I'm thinking. And a third of them reported improvement, but they still required pain medication. And a third of them reported no change. Um, what I think is extremely interesting about this new frontier of medicine is we need to study more of the third that responded and the environment and the variables in the environment. It isn't appropriate to only focus on the dosage of LSD without regard to the environment within which it was used. So I'm saying these are a, a new compound. If you, if you give the, the morphine, it possibly has some sensitivity to the environment in which it's given, but it's much, much, much less. One could, although it wasn't developed that way, one could develop morphine with double-blind placebo-controlled studies because you're looking for a drug whose specific effect is to turn off the pain. If you give the LSD to a person in great pain, it may enhance the pain for a while. And they may require your help in focusing on what the meaning of the pain is or in accepting the pain in some way. This may happen during the acute effects when the, the effects of the compound LSD are most pronounced during the 12 hours after it's given. The analgesia, and that may not be the right word for it, the freedom of pain, may last for three months, six months, the rest of the person's life. Um, we're talking in the case of addiction about um, people who have lost meaning in their lives. In the loss of meaning, they have found substitutes. Items from the environment that were used in a specific way offer them something that is almost as good as real life, almost as good as getting better, almost as good as having hope, almost as good as not having pain, but not as good. And in that case, one uses psychedelics to help people address the despair at the core of this use of a substitute rather than a real experience. And there's enormous pain in that place of using a substitute. Enormous despair, enormous rage and anger. But it's to be gone through, and uh, these compounds can help, can assist in a therapeutic process where an individual may go through that experience with transformative effect so that people speak of going to a, 
a place that is beyond time, that is beyond space, that is beyond words, that is the most real place in the universe, where they feel they touch the divine, they touch the spark of infinite meaning in the universe, and it suffuses them with understanding and strength to go on and live their lives and be the best people that they can possibly be. You're this doesn't talking, happen with everybody. You're talking about spiritual tools. Uh, it, it's, it, it's not possible to divide uh, the, the psychedelics from all the rest of the medicines <laughs> and speak of them as uh, spiritual tools. That's what they are. Yes, I think that that's a very important part but of... Uh, well, that pain but uh, but this, this gentleman, uh, you yeah, have been announced here as being the one psychiatrist in America to be able to work with LSD. I mean, uh, you had to go through an incredible amount of red tape, bureaucracy, making protocols, which is a well, story in itself. And uh, does, is it a hopeful sign for future use of LSD in therapeutic? Uh, Simon, let me uh, take a moment and clarify things. First of all, um, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, my wife is a psychiatrist, and we work together as a team. Um, the permission that we will work under is a permission that has been existent in the United States since the early 1960s. Uh, it's a permission that uh, work has been done with over 750 subjects with in the past. And the permission, in a sense, has never expired. It is possible always to design a new study and to extend the permission. Uh, and in fact, uh, with apparent success, we found that it's possible for the permission to be extended from one generation to the other. And Dr. Albert Kurland, the psychiatrist who has held this permission uh, throughout this period, has um, written to the Food and Drug Administration that he wishes to pass this permission on to us such that any studies that we begin could continue working to um, not be able to be associated with us were he to die. Uh, so it's with that permission that we're proceeding and, uh, and with a permission from the Drug Enforcement Administration to import our supplies from, from Switzerland. Uh, and then um, a Human Subjects Review Committee in California which passed a protocol to say it would protect sufficiently the rights of the subjects in our study. And now I've uh, committed that I feel it's very important that the um, approval for human beings not be 3,000 miles away from our location. So I've committed to uh, our institute forming its own board, institutional review board, fully assured by the federal government to meet its standards and to review our study. And we're at the stage where they have met and begun the education process toward reviewing the study. And this committee is a, it's got a, a, a Jesuit priest, uh, um, it, it has an a lawyer, or it has, it's, yeah, it's an ethical committee. It has representatives from different religions and from, from uh, lay people, uh, as well as a, a psychiatrist. How many of these permissions have been given? Are there more people in your place, you think? I, I think what's unique about our study, and there are other people uh, studying psychedelics, uh, Charlie Grobe, I think, stands in closest proximity to the kind of permission we have, but he stands with MDMA, which is a far newer drug, uh, and so he's earlier in a process. What will be unique about our project when we begin is that it will be the first project in some time in the United States that is using psychedelics with the basic approach of helping human beings to live better lives with them. So the basic tenet of our study is a treatment that improves people's life situation. You refer to the early work of, among others, Tim Leary and, and uh, in prisons and with alcoholics and people like that? Yes, Tim Leary was doing... In Mount, uh, there were many. Walter Pelanke, there, there was a golden age during which many many studies Before, were Before, uh, obviously, you became illegal. Yes, yes, and, and some after as well. Uh, I was, for instance, working in the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center until 1976, 
with cancer patients and training professionals and uh, treating neurotic outpatients and uh, working with alcoholics. And yeah. You have contact with European colleagues? Yes. You go to Heidelberg to a big conference? Yes. And you'll be at? Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about the, maybe <laughs> Let me Sasha, can you tell us about the Heidelberg okay. conference well, that's coming up? I'm going to go back for a moment and mm -hmm. try to integrate things that help. But you started out with the, the function of these materials in the finding of God and the determination of your relationship and your identification in the God thing. Mm -hmm. And then you drifted into the medical and the direct clinical application, which is a medical question. But in truth, this world did not start with Hoffman 53 years ago. It started with man 100,000 years ago. And there was a search there where there was a, perhaps a, a, a sac sacramental use in, the, in history. There's certainly the use in medicine, not in, in a double blind study with LSD, but in a medicine man taking the plant to find out why his patient is ill. It's a different type of a practice of medicine, but as ancient as man is. And then there are people who I've heard of even in, in, in Europe who are into raves who will use psychedelics with no idea of either medicine or God. I've also asked you about yeah. what you say about raves. Right. Yeah. And there are the people who happen to have a little friendship with, a, with another person. They may use them for the sexual uh, disinhibition that is a consequence. There are many, many uses of these things, and they, they span back to the origin of man. So it's a matter of, of this continuing search of man for who he is, what he is, how he relates. It may be done through a plant, may be done through a drug. A plant may be a drug in our definition, but for up until 200 years ago, drugs were not known to be in plants. The plants were the active things. It may be something from, from a, a religious uh, extreme in the church to self-flagellation to fasting. Meditation. meditation. These are all methods of searching a way of, of understanding a dialogue that goes on continuously. And it's not the drug, as, as, as Rick pointed out, it's not the drug that does it, it's you and the drug find a way in which this can be expressed. It's a matter of pain. The pain is part of your own making. And it's possible that you can come to some peace with it by understanding yourself. And so it, it's not a, a, a narcotic in the sense that a dead is a pain center. It is a material that allows you to be a little bit more uh, aware and more, perhaps, uh, more honest with with who you are. Deconditioned is the word used. Deconditioned. Deconditioned. Uh, Reprogrammed. Uh, uh, like you said, disinhibited. I would even go further and say it's, it's a matter of of becoming, of, be, uh, of learning what you know, and never were quite aware of the fact you knew it. Mm -hmm. Wait, what, do you want to talk about that? You know me. Well, I'll give my version of it. <laughs> In my uh, experience of this group, uh, it's basically a, a group, the ECBS, that uh, formed out of the ashes of the old European Psycholytic Association, which was an association of psychiatrists in Europe that were using LSD and other psychedelics in a psychodynamically oriented therapy with people, doing research and doing treatment, who were meeting in the 1960s and late 50s here in Europe. Uh, and out of the ashes of this and the repression of psychedelics and the expression of interest on the part of serious students uh, was born the European College for the Study of Consciousness, the ECBS. Um, the Heidelberg. And they are putting on, in Heidelberg, their second international congress. So it's a, a, for me as an American, it's a, it's a phenomenal, I've been to some of the, the, the Euro, just the European Congresses, and the, each one is a phenomenal experience of, uh, of colleagues, people who are very seriously attempting to study this area, and very seriously attempting to go forward against, I must add, enormous repression. There's, uh, it's, it's enormously difficult. The barriers are phenomenal. And uh, in some way, I think our study has gotten through on a, a prayer and an awful lot of history. You know, we're very lucky to be able to point to a record of impeccable safety in the past that uh, we're easy to criticize from many, many, many perspectives. Under all paradigms. 
Yes. Absolutely. So that's what the question was. I think, well, I think the thing about paradigms, you know, paradigms have become almost a buzzword, but I think the real um, central issue around it is to find ways to do studies that actually shift the focus and shift the point of view such that it is recognized, ah, perhaps there is another way. Perhaps there is something, as, as I call it, perhaps there is a psychedelic medicine as well as an allopathic medicine and a homeopathic medicine. And perhaps there will be necessary specialized techniques to, to study this phenomenon and to deepen our understanding of it. Well, I, I, I saw the word phenomenal because it says phenomenal. I think psychedelic is a much like more written word. Eh? Yeah, see the question. Do we have a microphone? You're talking, yeah. You're talking on the, my name is Hans Fong. You're talking on a high intellectual level, but the discussion in, in Holland right now at the moment is about the use of uh, psychedelic compounds in, say, a recreational method, a recreational way. This is what's bothering the people, well, uh, most of the time. So I would like to know what is your uh, You're the sociologist. Yeah. And Mr. Kaplan knows that situation, of course, which is quite different from the Americans. Yeah, I think this is some others from the other way, others, but NSA, I suppose. Yes. Thank you. Well, I think this is a uh, um, what makes uh, three Americans, me, living and working here for 12 years in, in the drug field, because this country is unique in seeing something that me, as a sociologist, has uh, knows theoretically, but puts it into practice that that drugs are cultural generators, that they can revive a culture and subculture through, through uh, uh, creating everyday rituals, trances, dances, visions, whatever. And this, uh, this country is a, is a, a wonder in, in, in engineering and with something that we Americans also know, a love for freedom to make it happen, but we Americans do it theoretically, but uh, they put it into uh, practice, which is uh, which is why I feel very much at home after 12, uh, 12 years of working, and working some of the ideas through that, that you guys are having in California and through, but get, that we can put into society. So what he's talking about, recreation, is, is really the other side of medicine. It's 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 a recreation is a very serious thing. I had a with Ava. Yes. yes. Recreation is a very serious thing because uh, recreation. We not we not only trying to uh, take the sick and and like Curato, the great Dutch uh, physician, said, maintain a homeostasis, but we're trying to go forward. We're trying to recreate our life in a in a better way, and these. Re this Amsterdam, where I live now in Maastricht, and with Carnival, which is a very traditional old European form, is a form of recreating cultures through alcohol, heavy alcohol, but alcohol put in, a, in the Limburg beer, where you have to be from Limburg or from the Netherlands to know what that means. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's sacred, and in, in, in the way that, that a mushroom might be sacred, and uh, but there's mushroom shops in Las Vegas as well. Yes, yes, I know, I know. So, so I think uh, I think uh, uh, the point is that I would like to see the discussion shift on, in response to that to what you said to the joy side of of these drugs, and I think the chemical love story was so beautiful because it. It, you can put these very cold scientific formulas in one half of the book next next to uh, next to flesh and blood and touching and feeling and uh, holding and come out with a 
with a, a book as, uh, as thick as the Bible. So <laughs> maybe, uh, mention a special demonstration and you say let me try to make clear and, and we all like to make clear some of the reasons that we I find the psychedelic experience a personal treasure because it does do something to your life once you take an LSD uh, willingly willingly or unwillingly your, your life has changed and, and what you see is, is more than you saw before so it goes another way but in your introduction you state then we have a, what we call a soft, soft drug problem with the French authorities who think differently about it. You say, among the drugs that are currently illegal, I have chosen not to use marijuana as I feel the lightheaded intoxication and benign alteration of consciousness, consciousness does not adequately compensate, compensate for an uncomfortable feeling that I am wasting time. You mean that the people who are taking marijuana are wasting their time? I have no comment on other people's use. I say that is my relationship. Yeah. Okay. But can you imagine people are not as deeply into your uh, thing, uh, trying to make their life a little bit more uh, easily by taking uh, marijuana? I mean, it seems there is, in Amsterdam, there's a steadying of the percentage of young people taking it. And in the rest of the country last week, uh, and, uh, a thing showed that it's, it's, it's going in. But, the 40 years ago it used to be different. The, the, the Amsterdam marijuana smokers knew each other at all. Mm -hmm. And now you go to football stadiums and waft of marijuana, <laughs> they, they go and they drink their beer, like I do. Yeah. No, this, uh, that was strictly just my, my relationship to, to that. It's not a, not a, uh, a constructive one for me. Others will find it quite different for them. I have other, other materials that I find to be uh, useful and to be valuable and others may find them to be totally unpleasant because light-headed intoxication well it's, it's lovely to, to, to have I think uh, <laughs> 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 and the benign alteration of consciousness maybe people can't stand for that the benign alteration of consciousness uh, like if you if you really would have cosmic consciousness you would you, you fall down and would be able to stand it, well, there's a, there's a I, 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 as you're speaking, I'm reminded of a, of a video I saw one time of some Indians in the lower part of the Amazon, actually on the Orinoco, uh, who were working with snuffs, and they snuffs, and they were working exactly that. They had these long tubes, and each would blow the snuff up into the nares of the other person at the same time, and then they would drop these these long tubes and sort of fall over backwards, vomit a little bit, stagger around a little bit, smile quite a bit, and after about an hour, sort of come back and join the, the, the tribe, the rest of the tribe. Are uh, they searching for God? I wonder if they are just having a... Well, that's not have to wait for the there. Yes. I mean, isn't that a funny thing of our society that we go to find something which is uh, all over? But this brings me to a second, <laughs> this brings me to a, a second of your, your beautiful uh, glossary. Stone. This generally means being under the influence of a psychoactive drug. It's a widely used word and we have employed it in our story as carelessly as most people do. However, in writing a report on the effects of an experimental drug, there's actually an important difference between being stoned and being turned on, which I call high. Uh, and the researcher should make a distinction between them. A stoning effect is one in which there is awareness of strongly altered states of consciousness. It may be pleasurable or unpleasant. It is characterized usually by a general will, inability and disinclination to deal with concepts or to employ insight. In other words, one finds it difficult to learn anything of value. On the other hand, being turned on is simply to be aware of a change in one's mind and our body in the direction of an increased sense of physical and mental energy. Being turned on is usually thought of as positive, whereas there are many researchers who do not enjoy being stoned at all. And I, that I can live with. I mean, that's a concept where you see people uh, doing nothing, but who knows what's happening inside while they're doing nothing. It's not very hard to see someone else. But this I wanted to... Uh, I, I think, <laughs> Yeah, but, but you also say, you also say, euphoria, you means normal. 
So, normal Europa, normal Europa, Europa. Yeah, not, uh, not hyper Europa, not hypo Europa, not dis Europa, but Europa. Yeah, yes, yeah. Europa. So, Europa, yeah. Europa in Europa. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that, isn't that time to say something? Yeah, there's something over there. Yeah. Somebody want to say? Is it Dan Ricardo. A question. The difference between the stone and being turned on, essentially the difference between indica and sabine. <laughs> 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 Is that a question or a comment? Indica. <laughs> 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 An interesting, an interesting uh, story is associated with that might as well bring Ruderalis into this too and have all of the various cannabis species. There's a uh, marvelous uh, gentleman, I don't think he'll be in Europe this year, known as uh, Schultes, Richard Schultes, who is brought into a case on exactly this. Is this marijuana indica or is it sativa? Or is it the, the, the defense claimed it was uh, cannabis Ruderalis? And so he was brought in and he said, well, no one really has determined if cannabis is a monotypic species or monotypic genus. Uh, there may be a ruderalis, but to really know that, I'll have to go to Afghanistan and look at it in bloom and bring back blossoms. And so there's an eight-month uh, delay in the trial. <laughs> and he got money from somewhere and went to, um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Afghanistan. This was before the Russian adventure there. Uh, looked, photographed, took pressings, brought them back to the Harvard Botanical Museum, wrote up this famous little four-page thing in Latin that's necessary to establish the reality of the new species. He was brought back to uh, the, the trial in San Francisco, and he gave a superb eight-hour lecture to the jury on the meaning of genus, the meaning of species, what a taxon is, what marijuana is, what blossoms are, and it was, it was a masterful lecture. Uh, which established that there was a ruderalis, and the, the, the defense might have some, some merit in pursuing that particular line. The judge, I think, did a beautiful, masterful 30-second sequel to that speech when he informed the jury, you've been heard an expert talk on an expert subject, you are to ignore his entire <laughs> testimony. Uh, and it was dropped from the court record. Uh, so is, this, the, is this why she's wonderful? <laughs> right. And so this was called the three species defense. It was tried, it failed, and I don't believe it's ever come up again. So I don't think I can distinguish between uh, uh, the sativa and indica. Sure, the long answer to us. And between Japanese and Moroccan, or Afghanistan and Colombian? No, no. So that's a, no we're, we in the, in the world of science uh, are always, especially in me, I've been always fights in, in my department with uh, uh, the, well, these drugs, uh, it's all, most of it is a placebo effect anyway, and uh, you know, what do you really need to take these things uh, seriously? Their dangers are much less than, than that. Do you, uh, in, in writing, uh, Colin, doing these, uh, working with your group of 10 people, I mean, maybe to, you could tell us a little bit about how you work with them, and can, can humans really differentiate between, well, I don't know about Lebanese and Moroccan, but uh, can, can, in the compounds that you did, did in, the, in the book, are they all the same, or, or can there be really reliable, subtle differences to say that these these uh, different compounds can be used in very specific ways, not only for medicine, but for recreational purposes and for, for getting a better quality in your life in a very specific way, like disinhibition or so. We'll see how I can address these 12 questions. Uh, first of all, I must emphasize the book is, is fictional. Mm -hmm. And uh, hence the. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> there are two parts to the book. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the, the, the second, the, the the second is the scientific. Book book. Mm -hmm. And then all the chemical yes. formulas and the dosages and the durations and the commentaries. Right. The, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that that huh? is, is written in a very excellent passive voice. Okay. It has the, the, the spirit of the uh, journal of medicinal chemistry. This okay. was added. To I was reading it by Castaneda. I thought it was for real. <laughs> oh. Uh, and therefore, such things as the experimentation with a group 
uh, is something that is uh, not permitted in the United States, and of course cannot now occur. Oh, yeah. and, uh, uh, it, it, it is prohibited in the United States through the uh, enactment in 1986 of a what's called an analog controlled substance analog bill that makes it illegal to administer to a person uh, a material that is uh, thought to have action similar to the materials that are illegal. It's a very, uh, very effective bill in stopping any research with individuals without specific and explicit government approval. So from that point of view, the, the, the group concept is, of course, fictional too. And any work that was done in, in, in the clinical sense in that preceded the, the passage of, of this uh, federal law. In answer to question number two of the, is it 12, 14, 12, 12. 12. Uh, the, the question dealt with, it, are there consistent effects that can come from the use of a given drug, again, a reliable, reproducible effect I, do, I don't believe this is possible because each time you reacquaint yourself with a, with a, with a plant, with a drug, it's a, it's, you bring a different thing to it. And very often, if it's a plant, the plant brings a different composition to you. These are not reproducible. Even with things that are absolutely reproducible pharmacologically, I should say chemically, like the placebo, uh, and are, as far as you can, reproducibly uh, confirmed by being the same individual, you're going to get different responses in different days. So I don't think you can ever look for an absolute definitive uh, uh, way of characterizing any any drug. Only well, from a from a pharmacokinetic point of view, maybe <coughs> some some drugs last longer than other drugs. Pharmacokinetics, yes, the, the the measure of how fast drugs get in and through right. the body into the site, as opposed to pharmacodynamics, which is the actual action of the drug and its right. action. Uh, I, I, I am in awe on the individual variation. We are pursuing a very interesting problem in San Francisco uh, in using nicotine as the drug. We're doing quite a bit of clinical studies with nicotine. And we find that the kinetics of the nicotine and its metabolites, cocaine and hydroxycocaine and on and on, in the human body, and we can account for about 90% of the, of the nicotine that goes in in the course of smoking, in all except one person. One lady who came originally from Chicago to San Francisco, we can only account for about 5% of her nicotine. The other 95%, as we say in English, has gone out to lunch. We have no idea where it is, where it goes. She is unique. Her, she smokes and her, her uh, responses to cigarettes are quite normal. She smokes in a normal amount. It's just that for, in her body, it goes somewhere totally different. And so I begin wondering, are these metabolites playing a role? Do they have any role? Are they perhaps uh, consequences of, of the body detoxifying? Might they be in some way promoting other actions or having feedback actions on a drug? This is not a simple matter of measuring how fast the drug goes up in the blood and how fast it drops away. So we want to collect a pile of urine from her because I want to get in and find out what she does with this material, this nicotine. We brought her back in, bless our soul, she had stopped smoking. And so we, suddenly we were stuck in an ethical point of view. We couldn't say, well, just smoke a little while again. <laughs> and so there she is. She is a very pleasant, very willing, cooperative person who no, no longer smokes. And we cannot use her as a machine to convert nicotine into strange, unknown things. Then we discovered she had a sister in Chicago who also smoked. So we flew the sister out and ran perfectly normal. Uh, so it was not a specific genetic thing that we could use. So this, this gave me a little bit of respect for the fact that when you put a drug in the body, you are not going to be able to predict where it goes, how much of it goes there, and definitely cannot predict what aspect of that drug or its fate or its interaction with the body of chemistry accounts for its particular pharmacology. Yeah, but there are definitely certain constants. I mean, if you take 2CB, you're sure it lasts for four hours. If I take LSD, I'm sure it lasts for 12 hours. These are clear-cut differences. No, no. True, but on the other hand, someone who takes 2CB may have no action from it whatsoever. 2CB is a, is, is a tricky one. Maybe. And LSD may, uh, if you believe some of the uh, rather uh, heroic reports of psychosis or permanent changes or long-term changes or flashbacks, if there's any validity in this, may have an action far more than eight hours. Mm -hmm. yeah, and for, in uh, 1959, the Dutch painter writer Armando said, I didn't feel anything. He'd taken LSD and uh, he said it didn't do anything for me. For history. <laughs> <laughs> there was a Congress uh, last year.
uh, Sharon and I in Milan with all the, uh, with all the uh, scientifics uh, of Europe together about serotonin. And they have made a conclusion that the NDMR destroyed some pathways from the pallidus, I, I, I believe from the pallidus, the center of the human brain, the brain stem towards the cortex. Is it true? Is it also a, a, a thing you found? Let me, let me start and I'll turn it over to you. First of all, uh, there is no evidence that I know of that uh, uh, MDMA uh, does any changes to the human brain. This is in work that's been done in primates, work that's been done in rats. Uh, if you look, however, at the work that's done in dogs, this, this, these, these changes do not occur. There are changes in some aspects of the axonic structure of the serotonin neuron, and they do have long-term changes in uh, a monkey. On the other hand, uh, you're hard put to say what is the difference between change and damage. So there is no documentation that man is indeed reflecting this. Uh, so I would be very cautious in explaining why MDMA is destructive to man when you don't have evidence that it is. It's, it's, a, it's a question, it's a searching for the answer to a different question. So I, 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 there's no question, I would, um, I would, I would an example, one, one brief example that I'll turn over to Rick to go into more of the, of the wet chemistry of the brain. Uh, but there was a, a talk that was given in, um, at, at the uh, Lawrence Radiation Lab about 10, 12 years ago by a, a researcher from NIDA, one of the large uh, funding agencies in the United States in, in drug, drug use. It was entitled, The uh, Mechanism of Action of Psychedelic Drugs. And I was very excited because I had been kind of searching in this territory for some answers for a few decades, and I hadn't really come up with a great deal yet. And here, NIDA could explain the mechanism of action. And so I went to the seminar with great interest and I left with a little bit of puzzlement because what he talked about is where radioactive materials went in a rat. And so I asked him afterwards, isn't this more a study of where radioactive psychedelics go in animals rather than how they work in man? He said, well, yes, of course, you can't really section the brain of a man to find out much about where they go. And I said, but to know where they go does not explain how they work. Well, that's the only thing we can look for. And uh, I find that it's a, it's a disappointment to me. What is the whole thing? You a beautiful study demonstrating exactly what you say. Uh, the study uh, of 95 ecstasy users that had uh, lower serotonin levels according to the researchers. But, uh, the psychologists that searched as well concluded that these people were nice, less aggressive, and that the changes that they saw the results, and that's how it works, were actually to be evaluated positively. You know the study I... Uh, I think the study was Johns Hopkins University. Yes. yes. Uh, to paraphrase one of their first reports in which they found a decreased level, they actually didn't look at serotonin. If I recall, they looked at the 5-hydroxy um, uh, metabolite, metabolite of serotonin, the indole acetic acid. Uh, the first of the studies they did in human, uh, human subjects, I find a little bit I'm uncomfortable with for two reasons. One, they did not give MDMA to people. They brought people in who said they had used MDMA and they had overlooked the idea of confirming the presence of MDMA in the body. <coughs> so it was, it was, it was an um, anecdotal population. The second point is the conclusion was brought out, we have found statistically insignificant decreases of the uh, metabolite in the spinal fluid. Um, it, but then they, they went on to say, uh, these results are not statistically significant, but they're highly suggestive. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but I can find a touch of bias in a, in a, in a, in a conclusion of that type. I, I, I'm referring to a second study. Uh, I, I don't know the specific uh, the author, etc. But the, the, the thing was that with the same anecdotal evidence about mm -hmm. use of people that should have used ecstasy and DNA more than 95 times or so, in the end, the conclusion of psychologists about the supposed effects of the brain damage that they suggested was that the changes were positive. People were less aggressive, nicer than the control population. 
So that I, what I wanted to say is to support your thesis about you may know where the drug goes, it doesn't say where it works. These trichologists. It, it's conceivably, conceivable that the trimming of a few neuro, uh, neuron axons might be a, might be a, a beneficial. We should not forget that, that uh, audiences are told in, in, the, in the newspapers that from England that people died from ecstasy and then it used to be doing house parties where there was not enough uh, air or whatever. Not, and enough air, not enough water, is this dying from ecstasy? No. Well, when they oh, but, uh, I had the situation not, not that long ago in which I was asked uh, specifically in the, in the legal situation if I thought ecstasy was a dangerous drug, because there had been deaths, not necessarily due to, but associated with, which is a, a different different form of, of uh, diagnosis. Uh, and I said, if there are 500,000 or a million people in England using this drug every day, every week, and you have five deaths, this would constitute one of the safest drugs I know of. Well, it's, it's interesting that the notions of damage. My uh, PhD dissertation was on the use of MDA, methylenedioxyamphetamine, uh, as an adjunct to psychotherapy in 10 neurotic outpatients. They had uh, from one to four experiences with MDMA or MDA and uh, uh, 75 hours of psychotherapy. And we followed them for uh, six months and a year. Um, one of the interesting results in that study, I really didn't quite know what to make of, I must confess. Um, it turned out that the people's IQ went up. It looked statistically significant. And in puzzling over the mountain of results that we got, which basically was a dramatic improvement in people's lives, and we were averaging, I hate to say it, bananas, oranges, apples, and pears. <laughs> Uh, and we still got dramatic improvements. Um, but this statistically significant increase in IQ, well, first of all, we were using an IQ measure called the Raven Progressive Matrices that is not a standardized <coughs> IQ test, although it's highly correlated with a standardized IQ test. We found the test retest reliability was very high. And in puzzling over it, our actual best shot as clinicians treating patients was that people were confused and anxious and upset and depressed, and when they were no longer confused and anxious and depressed and upset, they fought better. Then, uh, the same team that found uh, these terrible results with MDMA prefaced their findings with MDMA with a magnificent little study where they gave inordinately high doses of MDA to rats intravenously for, I believe it was something like a week, and then slaughtered the rats, and lo and behold, using the Finkheimer stain method, which is a sort of a state of the edge of fuzzy art and science, found that there were, there was damage to the serotonin Nerve terminals. Well, I must confess, uh, my impression was uh, that yes, uh, I think that probably MDA and MDMA2 are not ideal drugs. LSD, on the other hand, is quite ideal. But um, these, and of course, LSD broke your chromosomes X years before, viewed through the same fuzzy edge of state of the art science. And this didn't hold up. So I talked to some of my colleagues at the research center, and I said, you know, what do you think we were doing to people? Maybe we were thinking about it in the wrong way. We all got together, and we tried to think about what is it that we did. And, uh, you know, we tried to be very creative about our brainstorming and to give up all of our preconceptions. And so uh, we kind of did a systems analysis of the whole thing. And we decided that what it was is we were killing off bad brain cells. And the good brain cells were surviving, and so the people were thinking better. And that perhaps these compounds were pruning the brain in a, in a, in a way that one might prune a tree, and that actually it was improving 
the function. And this is as valid a hypothesis as the other hypothesis <laughs> yes. that I've contained here. Uh, and uh, it's uh, as political as the others. And I, I think what's very, very difficult in this field is that uh, um, science is a big political football and science is for sale. And so it's extremely difficult. We talk about uh, horrible genetic damages from compounds. And a generation of people was scared. And they were scared that their children would be deformed. And you look at tribal groups that have been using compounds identical to or highly similar to these for <coughs> centuries, and you don't see any unusual incidence of malformation or difficulty. So I just ask you to consider for a moment being the victims of scientific terrorism and how it feels. There must be something wrong with these compounds because their implications are too profound for a culture that might otherwise destroy itself. But a lot of money can be made in the process of destroying itself. A lot of money can be made in desacralizing healing and, me and medicine. A lot of money can be made in turning away from spirituality because we have reached a kind of stage in human development where we have these huge melting pots, which I believe Europe to be, and I believe the United States to be, and I believe Latin America to be, where we're mixing many, many cultures together, many different viewpoints. And it's possible for us to say, no, we've had bad experiences with this, so we divorce church and state. We don't deal with this at all. There will be no spirituality. This is a scientific and technological culture. But there is another alternative, that there is a spirituality that is pointed to by, re by religious research, a highest common denominator for all of humanity that something that joins all of us together with the commonality and the highest common denominator rather than the lowest common denominator. And the implications of these compounds are that perhaps they may be ways to allow this to occur. 